evening and welcome. It is so good to have you all joining us this evening. It looks like folks have been able to log on okay. Uh, happy October. Welcome to McKinsey River Trust Second Habitat, an introduction to uh, stage zero river restoration. Uh, let me just, there we go. Let me just check one setting here. Make sure I'm right. Sorry about that. There was a little technical difficulty there, but I, I think I'm I'm now up and running here. Um, so my name is Holly McRae, and I am the events and outreach manager for McKinsey River Trust. And I'm so glad you're here. Before we begin, I'm gonna go over just a few uh, pointers about the Zoom platform. When you entered the webinar this evening, the system automatically put you on mute and turned off your webcam. So you are in a view only, listen only mode. After Jared's presentation, we'll have some time for questions and answers. So to submit a question, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can submit those at any point during the presentation this evening, and we may not have time to get to all of them at the end, but um, we will do our best. And if you have to leave the presentation for any reason or have technical difficulties, I'll be sending out an email tomorrow to all our registrants that includes a link to tonight's presentation. I know that uh, many of you who are attending tonight are friends and members of McKinsey River Trust. Please know that we appreciate your support and really miss greeting you in person with hugs and handshakes and seeing your faces out on the land. For those of you who are new to MRT, welcome. McKinsey River Trust is a nonprofit land trust that works to protect the lands and rivers we love in Western Lane County. Our organization has been at this work for 31 years. We have 6,700 acres of land under our management from the Cascades to the coast. Throughout the year, we're engaged in restoration and stewardship activities. We provide volunteer opportunities for those wanting to get their hands dirty and help us achieve our work. And in non-COVID times, we offer tours and educational opportunities on the land. If you would like to join us in this work, a gift of any size makes you a member. And later this evening, I'll post a link in our chat box if you would like to join us and become a member. As I was preparing for tonight's presentation, I was thinking about what I would normally be doing during this time of year, um, which is my favorite, late September, early fall. I would have been leading tours up at Finrock Reach, welcoming the salmon back to their home spawning grounds. I would have been preparing for the salmon celebration, an annual event led by the McKinsey Watershed Council. And I would have found some time to take my daughter and my husband to the river's edge um, for some quiet salmon spawning, viewing, and marbling, which is one of our, our favorite family activities. COVID had already changed our plans for public outreach events, but the recent holiday farm fire has, of course, uh, changed things in ways that we are really only starting to understand. The relationship between natural processes, such as fires, flooding, and erosion, and humans is complicated. At times we're left to bear witness to the incredibly powerful forces of nature and other times we're active participants in those processes, sometimes mimicking or using them to achieve our goals for the landscape. That is what river restoration is all about. I wake up each and every day grateful for the opportunity to work for an organization that in partnership with other organizations works hard to restore our rivers and protect the habitat that they create for species such as salmon. I am also grateful to know that as we sit here tonight in front of our computer screens, the salmon are spawning in the side channels and the tributaries of the McKinsey River, just as they have done for generations. I would now like to introduce our speaker for this evening, Jared Waybright. Jared is the Executive Director for the McKinsey Watershed Council. He has worked with the council since 2004 in a variety of roles, including restoration project management, youth education coordination, and public outreach. He has developed and implemented a wide range of cooperative projects in partnership with private landowners, public agencies, schools, and other nonprofit organizations over the past 15 years. Jared has a fisheries background and worked for seven years with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife prior to his tenure with the McKinsey Watershed Council. 
So Jared, um, at this point, I'd like to take, let you take it from here. And um, for the folks that are watching, please don't forget to enter those questions in the Q&A box as they pop in your head during the presentation. So Jared, why don't you go ahead and take it? All right, hello, good evening, uh, Holly. Thanks for that presentation. Um, with that, with that background, I just want to say that I'm very enthusiastic about being here with you all tonight. The the work that we're going to share with you all uh, this evening has really been a game changer um, in terms of the council's mission to uh, protect and enhance the Mackenzie River. If you add up all the metrics, uh, you know, in terms of acres, logs, culverts, etc., um, from the council's nearly 50 or 25 years of existence. Um, it would only be a fraction of the work that we got done in two short years uh, working on the South Fork. The, these projects that we're going to talk about this evening um, really, in my mind, have the potential to implement badly needed river restoration at a scale that, as far as I'm aware of, has not really been achieved um, in, in Western Oregon. So we're really excited about this and everyone's again happy to have this opportunity to uh, share with, with it with you this evening. So give me half a second here and I'll pop the slide up. All right, so we're going to talk about an introduction to stage zero river restoration this evening, and we're going to focus um, on implementation on the South Fork Mackenzie River. So this evening, I'm going to give a little bit of background on uh, different approaches to river restoration. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some accepted and, and really solid science called uh, the stream evolution model talk about implementation, project implementation on the South Fork, briefly touch on some initial monitoring results um, from, from over the last two years uh, on the South Fork Mackenzie River, and then talk a little bit briefly and just end the presentation with some next steps before we get to your questions. Um, I've got a lot of slides. I tried to cut it down as much as I possibly could. Uh, still ended up with quite a bit. So I'm gonna go really quickly in, in, in some, some sections and slow down in others, just because so we can reserve a good um, quarter of our time or so together uh, for questions and discussion. There we go. All right, so I want to talk about just a little bit of background on land management practices over the last century, really, and, um, and, and how they've impacted and altered uh, rivers and floodplains in obvious and maybe sometimes not so obvious ways. Dams have blocked upstream fish passage and downstream transport of sediment, flow, and wood. Development has cut off rivers from their floodplain and the conversion or harvest of riparian forests has, has altered aquatic and terrestrial habitats. What I'd like you all to focus on for tonight's chat though, is the impacts, on, uh, uh, impacts of stream confinement and associated drops in the water table. So you've got this nice cartoon here that we'll, we'll return to a couple different times this evening. So early on, there was widespread recognition of the need to address these impacts and restore uh, river habitat. Early efforts were largely focused on um, restoring stream channels, many of which were already incised and channelized and impacted themselves. These efforts were relatively small in scales and relied on a, a, on a fairly uh, high degree of engineering and were largely artificial me measures that you kind of see outlined here in the photos, gabions that were uh, uh, that re that required um, uh, chain link fencing, um, very artificial, uh, uh, either boulder and or in this case log weirs, and then in, in some cases, actually fairly widespread uh, log jams held in place with cables. These the, these these the, these approaches and these features created uh, made them very susceptible to failure and really kind of limited their uh, benefits to really short term durations. Over time, these, develop, the, these approaches to river restoration adapted a more natural method. Whole trees with root wads attached were used. Uh, they were placed in methods that kind of mimicked wind throw or uh, uh, landslide type events. And in some cases, it was really recognized as the need to reconnect the river with its floodplain and created either artificial channels or small notches to get the river back onto floodplains that had either been diked or, or, or uh, uh, or disconnected through levees and berms. In 
And just like any good practitioner, um, over the course of time, folks, Forest Service, nonprofit organizations, and many others, private landowners, um, really took to heart some lessons learned from several decades of river restoration. And one particular lesson learned that I want to focus on this evening is uh, occurred in, in uh, the Saislaw River um, near the town of Florence. Uh, there was a remeander project that looked to uh, diversify what had been a channelized creek and remeander it through a pasture. Um, and you can kind of, as, as the picture in the, uh, the upper picture shows in the, in the slide here. And the first winter, what happened, and if you can see my cursor and some of the yellow, the yellow um, arrow and the blue uh, arrows here, a fairly large landslide came down and filled this constructed channel with a large degree of debris and sediment, woody debris and sediment. And initially, uh, this was viewed as a complete disaster and a failure of the project until practitioners started watching this process a little bit and noticed that in this reach, that sediment and that wood was creating really nice, complex and diverse habitats, and doing an excellent job of connecting that creek up with on its floodplain, which provided numerous habitat benefits. So over time, this basic guy, this, this idea from this relatively happy accident got applied in a number of different projects at different scales in central Oregon, out near uh, Florence on the Saislaw River. And then in 2016, we here on the McKenzie, the McKenzie Watershed Council um, in, in, cooperative, uh, in cooperation with the McKenzie River Ranger District, were able to implement a project on Deer Creek um, in the upper McKenzie. And this project focused on reconnecting to the extent possible the creek across its entire valley bottom instead of just focused on that narrow stretch of channelized main stem channel. And so what we, what we did here is removed roughly about five acres of channel con confining berms, used that material to a grade about five, uh, half a mile of the, of, of the stream channel, and then place large woody debris, not only in the stream channel itself, but across the entire floodplain. We really liked the initial results of this project. And then during the initial um, uh, reporting and some of the outreach and just presentations, came across some research that showed some folks and some that were thinking along the same lines and it actually published a paper in 2013. So this 2013 paper by Clorin Thorne um, came out, updated the classic channel evolution model, which depicts the stages of incision and widening that a stream goes through in response to disturbance. The traditional model assumes that the pre-disturbance condition in, in alluvial systems is a sinuous, primarily single thread channel, as you can see here in stage one. Chlorin Thorne, however, provided evidence that pre-disturbance conditions was not necessarily a single thread channel in large unconfined streams, low gradient streams, but rather a braided network of channels and wetlands that were frequently flooded and had a diversity of habit wetland and riverine habitats. Rather than completely changing this stream evolution model, they introduced this pre-disturbance condition as a stage zero and plugged it right into this stream evolution model. This finding this paper and connecting with these, these researchers was really a kind of an aha moment um, and, and showed that, that there were others out there that had kind of come to the same conclusions we had as, as, as practitioners. And we've been working with these researchers ever since um, on development and of these projects and presenting results. Um, throughout Oregon, the Pacific Northwest, and even nationally and a little bit internationally as well. So a little bit earlier in this year, since these projects are kind of growing in popularity and there's a lot of, a lot of interest, a group of practitioners got together in or Oregon and, and came up with a kind of a working definition of what we mean by um, stage zero rep restoration. I'm not gonna read that to you, but I wanna, want you to focus on, in on the underlying, underlying words that we're trying to work across the entire valley instead of that confined channel. We're looking to not necessarily um, 
uh, place highly engineered and, and project or, or uh, habitat structures that we expect to remain over time. We're basically putting the ingredients back into the system and letting natural processes may form and maintain those habitats. We're really also trying to encourage deposition of sediment, nutrients, and large wood, connect the floodplain across the entire valley, and really encourage the, the, the development of a variety of diverse and complex habitats. And that's what that nice little uh, cartoon there depicts, and we'll come back to that one as well. So with that background, it's a little bit easier to understand some of the impacts of of um, land use practices over the last over the last century, they really can find that channel down into a single thread channel instead of a low velocity depositional area. We have a uh, essentially a fire hose that pushes at high velocity that pushes sediment, large wood, and nutrients out of the system. We've lost all connection um, or most connection uh, with the floodplain uh, and associated with with the channel confinement, we have a drop in the water table significant reductions in habitat complexity and diversity in amounts. So again, with that background, it's kind of under easy to understand, a little bit easier to understand the difference between a more channel-centric approach to river re restoration that we went over initially, that's really focused on the channel itself and depicted in with this top cartoon right here with the large wood and, and boulders, really working on a small kind of site scale um, with limited impact versus a stage zero approach that's trying to restore natural processes that will create the, these habitats and maintain them over time that removes to the extent possible these barriers depicted in red, fills incised channels, reconnects water, across the entire valley bottom, raises that water table, and then adds significant amounts of large wood throughout the entire floodplain, not just the channel. It's a really important point. So after the development of, or after the implementation of, of a lot of our early projects, um, which relied mostly on field fit design and implementation, or field fit design of, of the, uh, of the projects. In 2018, some colleagues in the Forest Service and, and a couple of researchers came up with a design methodology that's reliant on LIDAR um, to uh, create and design these stage zero restoration projects. So a quick primer on LIDAR, a, if, if you don't know, it's a process um, for measuring distances by illuminating the target, i.e. the ground, the earth's surface, with laser light and measuring the reflection back with the sensor. This tool has really revolutionized watershed scale planning and design. The level of planning without LIDAR associated with these projects would take months or even years to uh, acquire all that data and with much great, much less accuracy being out in the field, working through heavy brush, trying to determine these, these uh, elevations across the landscape. Um, LIDAR has been invaluable for this work. So what you're looking at here is what, what is called a relative, what we call a relative elevation map. And so this is a bare earth image taken with LIDAR um, that's removed all vegetation. Here is a road. You can kind of see it in a nice little hairpin turn that comes around here. And this is Deer Creek winding its way from uphill to downhill here. And then what you're seeing here is the darker grays show deeper depth. So this is bathymetric LIDAR that actually can shoot elevation through uh, standing water um, all the way up to the lighter colors or the, excuse me, the warmer colors, which are the higher surfaces. And what the project is trying to do is create white and blue surfaces throughout the project area where the water would have access to at any given point of the year, not just at high flows, but at low base flow, low time, you know, late summer, early fall type flows. So this was a design methodology with, that was then used on the South Fork, uh, Mackenzie River, high priority area uh, for both the Forest Service 
and the and, and the Mackenzie Watershed Council. You can see it's critical habitat for bull trout and spring spring chinook. But then also, historically, and this is once again another lidar photo. Um, what you're looking at here is the Mackenzie River coming from my right downstream to the west, and then the South Fork coming from the relatively um, what it would that be southeast to the northeast before then trending west and joining the Mackenzie River right here. And so what lidar can show us is really is give us a be much better idea of what historic. Uh, floodplain and channel conditions actually were. You can see this very complex network of braided channels throughout this just alluvial um, deposits here, this floodplain, super, super complex. If we were able to put the, if I had another map that shows, put the flow, the current flow back on, it would be confined to this single channel right here. And so not only does the South Fork is, South Fork of priority because of the species that are there, but it really retains a lot of its habitat qualities, um, historic habitat qualities, and really makes it a high priority for restoration. So there's a nice aerial view of the South Fork, uh, Mackenzie River, kind of looking, looking uh, west. Uh, as Holly alluded to, this looks a little bit different. Unfortunately, this looks uh, uh, a little bit different right now. This was in the burn area, and I'll get to that in just a little bit. I don't have any pictures to share, but this was within the burn area, but it, it looks like the, the project area actually came through pretty well. And so a little bit of orientation right here. Uh, this is Ofter Heidi Road. There's a road bridge at about uh, River Mile 2 over the South Fork. And then Cougar Dam is another two miles off to my left, off, off the screen here. So as I alluded to um, with Cougar Dam, uh, South Fork's been subject to a number of land use uh, management practices over the last century that have really altered the system. Um, driving over that off the Heidi Bridge, you look out and you, you, you see what might look like a, a really uh, uh, unimpacted idyllic river. A little bit closer examination shows a very highly impacted and altered system. Uh, very much in size due to the uh, uh, lack of incoming sediments um, blocked by Cougar Dam. Uh, very uni uh, very uh, uniform uh, and simplified habitat, lack of large wood, lack of, lack of connection with, with, the, with the floodplain. Uh, historic logging removed large swaths of the riparian forest. And one thing that we didn't really understand until we actually started getting work, work in these systems uh, those practices not only remove logs, a lot of times they would set up little push burns and levees to dry out areas to get in there. And then once the, the logs were harvested, they would leave those and really disconnect the, the, the floodplain. So really what we're looking at here is very much simplified uh, habitat. And so I want to take a moment to then tie that back to the stream evolution model. And so what potentially could have been this stage or this stage is really in this kind of arrested degradation uh, stage where it's highly impacted, but because of the lack of ability to have natural processes perform uh, services to uh, create and disturb and basically disturbance on the landscape, you're in this kind of this static place where you're not creating or destroying habitat. And so really the only way to come back in there is to do it manually. It doesn't have the means to actually heal itself, the river in its current state. So another quick map of the South Fork, We've got Cougar Dam down here to, down here to my right. Um, we, the project is currently designed uh, in, to, to be implemented in four phases. Um, that might change a little bit. Um, but currently we're still working on that. We implemented phase one in 2018, phase two in 2019, took 2020 off, and we're looking to do phase three um, in a couple of years and I'll return to that. So once again, here's the Mackenzie River and Ofter Heidi Road right there. So I'm gonna go through a series of maps uh, for the lower South Fork. Once again, they're back to that relative elevation map. And so the blues are the deeper and the current um, or, or the pre-project uh, flow pass of the, the river, essentially. 
there's the McKenzie River right there, and the yellows and the reds are higher elevation. So we have the project boundary, this phase one and phase two project boundary outlined in gray. And so the first step with the project is to identify areas that we want to cut or excavate. And so the idea is that we go in there and we're gonna remove, excavate all these areas down to a target elevation determined through that design methodology developed in 2018 to connect wide swaths or uh, reconnect wide swaths of the floodplain. So one thing that this removing these does, it creates brand new flow surfaces right through here, but then it also reconnects existing floodplain. This is unwatered, this is, this is an old flow path that probably wasn't, hadn't seen water since before Cougar Dam or maybe even earlier. There's a couple other good examples of reconnected channels right there. So you've cut all this material, you've got to do something with it. It goes into the incised main stem, old main stem channel. Sometimes our grading, that, 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 that uh, a grading depth really varies, um, two to three to four to sometimes in a couple of places in phase one, especially, it was about 15 feet of fill, pretty, pretty dramatic. And then once you're done, place large wood throughout. And we'll talk a little bit there, a little bit more about that. One thing that was special about this project is there was large swaths of the floodplain that we reactivated and enhanced. And rather than tracking heavy equipment in through those, those stands and disturbing those riparian stands, we used a helicopter to place, place log, most of this wood kind of on the, uh, the bottom, left, bottom left corner of this project map. So I'm gonna go through a couple of pictures of implementation. And so the first thing that we wanna do with these projects is we wanna work in the dry. Placing sediment directly into moving water is a big no-no. Uh, we'd be out of compliance pretty quick with, uh, with all our permits. Um, and it just obviously makes it a heck of a lot easier uh, to work in dry conditions. So in both phase one and phase two, we diverted the entire South Fork McKenzie River. Um, worked with the Corps to, to, to reduce flows as much as possible, um, but we were still diverting, if you're familiar with, uh, with river flows, probably about, I think it was about 300 CFS on average. Um, so quite a bit of water. And this, this photo does a good job of, of uh, kind of giving you a good idea. In phase two, we actually constructed a, a diversion channel that you see uh, over here on the lower right. In phase one, we used primarily an existing side channel. We just constructed about a thousand feet and then um, diverted the flow into that side channel. Use um, woven uh, fabric sacks filled with local material to place kind of a, a berm and then directly across or perpendicular uh, to flow and then build sediment behind it to keep those in place and just slowly work your way out. A little bit of impact for, for sedimentation, but really not too bad, especially when you have a, a skilled excavator, uh, operator, excuse me. So this is what a dewatered, uh, the dewatered South Fork River pre-project looked like. Um, this is a, <laughs> a feature that my colleague from the Forest Service, uh, Kate Meyer, likes to, to, to use. Um, refers to these systems as zombie systems, uh, just that you know the habitat's there, but it, it's, it, it's not doing much. You can see that it is very much uh, dominated by boulder and cobble. The fine material has been swept out, very little um, habitat for Chinook, uh, salmon, or other, uh, some of our other focal species. And no, that's not a weapon that she's, she's not a zombie killer down there. That's actually a stadia rod taking some survey measurements. So a couple pictures of the, uh, what the cut zones look like. At this point, once that water is diverted, it's very much just turns into a, a construction project, uh, cut and fill show. And so this, this excavator, this, uh, this excavator is loading an off road dump truck, about 25 uh, cubic yards. And keep that number in mind when we come back to that a little bit. Um, first of all, all the vegetation is removed, set aside and used for later placement. And then that sediment is then taken and placed into the incised channel. And then this is what a completed cut zone looks like. And what does that surface look like? This, is, this looks like a dry riverbed. I mean, and that's basically what it is. This is alluvium, historic alluvium deposits from way back when um, that's now been re-exposed. And so we're not creating channels here. This is just a good picture to show we're not creating channels, we're creating surfaces. We'll put large wood back on this, let the, put the water back on it, and then let the water create the channels and the flow paths that it wants. And then here's what fill looks like. 
This is a really great picture for a couple reasons. Um, it's just dramatic um, to think that this used to be, you know, a, a living and flowing river at one point, it will be again, uh, but also shows the depth of, of, of fill. This has actually already been filled, what the dump truck is filling there right there, has already been filled for two or three feet and it's being filled another four feet. So really a lot of sediments going in here. And this is also great for showing that we're using all types of sediments. Um, not just, not just uh, cobbles and gravels, but also the fines, which are really important and I'll get to in just a second. And then we're adding large, large quantities of wood. I don't know if you caught it with the Deer Creek slide from a little bit. We, we, we placed large wood on Deer Creek in 2016 at, at, a, at a density of about uh, 14 pieces per acre. On the South Fork, it was about 23 or 24 pieces uh, per acre. So quite a bit more wood. Wood places throughout, and the purpose of the wood is to just provide the building blocks for diverse habitat, complex cover, helps form pools, and then it really, really helps form and, uh, uh, and, and direct water. It provides roughness on, in, 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 the, in the river itself that's going to continually change uh, the directions of the flow and really help it um, from, or prevent it from forming a uh, single thread channel again. The idea is eventually, that this wood will be replaced by vegetation that's gonna come back up. So once that wood's placed, we take, we flip the water from the diversion channel or the side channel back onto the project area. And this is the upper portion of phase two um, almost immediately after it was rewatered. A couple of things to point out in certain areas, we do little technical things like leave certain areas uh, um, as leave pools. We don't fill them. So they kind of jumpstart the creation of deep pools um, there's also a couple of spots where we'll leave uh, existing vegetation as leave islands to kind of jumpstart revegetation and then provide a little bit more shade and, uh, and uh, uh, having that complexity. So once that water is put back onto the surface, it's going through existing uh, vegetation like uh, wood uh, or excuse me, willows, and also surfaces like, like existing forests that, that haven't probably seen that water since before Cougar Dam. And it's also then filling some of those relic side channels at really, really deep, uh, uh, deep levels. This was that big sweeping side channel that, that uh, you saw earlier in the relative ele elevation map. Um, very deep flow, cre creating some really nice instant habitat. It's really pretty, pretty remarkable. Snorkeling this was, was, was a joy, um, really fish everywhere. It was pretty, pretty remarkable. So gorgeous picture, uh, looking up the South Fork from the confluence with the Mackenzie, um, and just a nice background to just re briefly touch on um, um, uh, summary metrics um, from this project. So I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, this dwarfed anything that we've done um, over the last 25 years. And once again, accumulate, you know, if, if you um, sum up all those metrics, it, it is maybe only half, um, maybe a little bit more of, of what we got done in two years here. So we, we enhanced about 200 acres of floodplain on the South Fork McKenzie River, um, over about 1.25 stream miles. You gotta be careful with that stream mile metric because if you're just looking at stream miles, you're not getting a whole picture of the, of, of the, of the scope of this project, just because we're doing so much in the floodplain. 40 acres of disturbance of cut zones and roads and access areas um, that were now either being replanted or we're seeing uh, uh, natural vegetation regenerate. We moved um, almost 120,000 cubic yards of material. So if you think back to uh, what we said about that off-road dump truck uh, holding about 25 cubic yards, you can see that's a lot of material and a lot of trips. Some of that material is pushed with bulldozers, but the majority of it went in those trucks. Uh, we placed over 4,000 uh, pieces of trees at a little bit over, uh, it looks like a 20, 21 trees per acre. This whole thing cost about $3 million to implement, which is a huge price tag once again dwarfs anything we've ever done. But then if you break it down on scale, it's really quite comparable to some of the other work that we do, like repair, repairing and restoration projects that we usually price around nine to $15,000 an acre. And so this comes out well within that range with great, greatly enhanced and more immediate benefits. So since we're looking at aerials, thought I'd show a couple, a couple more. This is looking um, downstream on the McKenzie or on South Fork, there's the McKenzie River right there. Confluence is about right here. And you can kind of see um, the scope of the project. These are the cut areas here that are now flow surfaces. This is a 
uh, reconnected side channel. Uh, you can see some darker areas here that are leaf ghouls. I don't believe this one here. Yeah, this one shows some nice leaf islands and gives you a better picture of what that leaf pool looks like. Really gorgeous aerial photos. So I mentioned it before, seeing a wide variety of vegetation return to these disturbed areas. Lots of willow and ash coming back and it makes sense of their species that, that thrive on disturbance. Uh, macrovertebrates uh, have really, really responded well. This is one of the biggest concerns that we had. How, how long would we impact? Um, what kind of impact would we have on the, on, on the insect community? Um, we haven't full, done the full monitoring yet on the South where it's not complete. We don't have enough data yet. But similar projects on the on, on, on Deer Creek have shown that mackerels have really responded very, very quickly um, and come back with greater quantity and greater diversity. It's, it's really pretty encouraging. Um, work on both macroinvertebrate studies on both Deer Creek and, and South Fork are continuing. So hopefully over time we'll have more data and points on that. Beaver went crazy on the project. Uh, really exciting to see a couple of great photos there. And this is a really telling and kind of obvious and intuitive map. So the upper map is a pre-project wetted area at both base and high flows. The dark is base flow and the light is um, high flows. Um, you can see a lot of these side channels were only connected via groundwater primarily at, at high flows and some were completely disconnected. And then post-project, uh, just a, a remarkable um, increase in wetted area. And so since this water is moving slower, there's more wood to retain on the time, it's actually in a lot of places uh, deeper. So what, that, what, what the project is doing is actually holding water on the landscape longer. So we're bringing the zombie back, uh, just to kind of remind you back uh, to, to that uh, uh, dewater channel photo. And really what you're seeing there in, in, this, um, in this graph is a depiction of what that sediment um, looks like. Very much dominated by boulder and cobble with just a little bit of sand and a little bit of gravel. Um, post project, it's almost completely flipped. There you're seeing lots of sand, you're seeing lots of gravel. These are all taken on five transects that cover the entire um, uh, valley width. Got some brave souls doing those, doing those surveys and I'll have a photo of that here uh, just toward the end. So sand and sill is actually super important for habitat. Uh, a good, great example of Pacific lamprey uh, that can spend up to seven years buried in this stuff, filter feeding before they head out to the, uh, to the Pacific Ocean. Also really important for a host of macroinvertebrate and other insects. Um, and then of course, gravels are critical to the um, uh, Spring Chinook salmon and other salmonids that we find. Um, in the South Fork McKinsey River. I'll show you a map here in just a second. We got a couple of spring Chinook salmon uh, spawning on a red within the project area uh, almost immediately after it was completed. So a really good in indication that, yeah, we had a lot of disturbance, but cleaned up really quick because these fish immediately came back and used it. So this is a depiction then of where we saw reds in 2019. Um, 240 seen in, in uh, the project area in 2000, uh, in last year, just a little, kind of a little bit of qualifiers with that. These are fish that otherwise would have been, yes, these are fish that otherwise would have been in, this, in the South Fork, but spread out over the entire system, hunting for what limited habitat remains. The fact that they mostly, uh, or you know, the vast majority uh, used the, the project area is really a testament to the, 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 uh, the quality of the habitat created through this project. And here's the survey work um, being done. I referred to the transects earlier. Uh, so this is not only going across um, uh, the floodplain, but actually going through the, the wetted areas. So this transect work is part of a four-year um, monitoring project that's ongoing in partnership with the Forest Service, ODFNW, OWEB, um, OSU, and, and, and the council. Um, other work going, taking place um, on the South Fork over this period is uh, focus on monitoring uh, spring chinook salmon, both ju juveniles and spawning adults. Uh, there's a couple researchers based out of the U.S. Uh, Forest Service Pacific Northwest Research Station at OSU that are looking at a food web study, uh, as well as we're doing some eDNA uh, collection and macroinvertebrate sampling. Um, and also using a variety of remote sensing tools, LIDAR and uh, aerial imagery, to, to really try to get a handle on 
uh, geomorphic response and complexity with this project. We're about two years into that, about a year and a half into that project, COVID and uh, now the fire threw out a couple of wrenches. So that four year project might turn into a five year project. We're also looking at um, broadening the scope of this, of this project, not only to phase three and phase four implementation on the South Fork, but really looking at other projects in this immediate vicinity of the South Fork, both upstream and downstream. It's a concept we call the Middle Mackenzie Floodplain Enhancement Project. And that includes the Trust Finrock Reach uh, property, where we're looking at some similar types of restoration options um, on that property, as well as some other opportunities in both the tributary and the main stem, or off the main stem, excuse me. And there's an example of some conceptual and planned designs on Finrock. Existing um, gravel ponds would be brought down and then the light blue would be the connected flow pass throughout that property. Light blue would be the, um, some of the filled incised, um, currently incised channels. So I think I did pretty well on time and leaving us about 15 minutes or so um, for questions. Great, thank you so much, Jared. Um, let's see here, let's bring up our questions. It's not too late to enter your questions. Just go ahead and do that in the, the Q&A box. Um, one question I have here for you from Nancy is, do you use historical data to determine the cut and fill areas? Uh, good question. So yeah, I would say it's a combination. So, you know, the, the, the LIDAR information um, is, is like the initial starting place. Um, and so we take that information out on tablets or, uh, or, or smartphone, really. There's a couple apps that will help you track exactly where you are. And then that's ground truth. And so historic, I, I guess the way I would interpret that question, we use historic relevant channels to make sure, you know, to, to basically ground truth and see does this LIDAR data make sense with what we're seeing in our eyes with channels to our best estimate um, haven't been disturbed and might be a good indication of what those historic elevations might be. Hope that answered your question. Great. All right, our next one for you. Uh, will you need to periodically replace sediment since it does not flow naturally through Cougar Dam? Great question. Yes, that 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 is a um, that in, in this in this project area uh, that is a problem we can't necessarily address. We we are immediate uh, adding immediate sediment. So part of the planning um, for this project has been the periodic. Um, addition of sediment. Sediment budgets have been done and calculated uh, for the South Fork Mackenzie, um, and those range from about 1,500 to 5,000 uh, cubic yards. And so we have a stock, currently have a stockpile of about 20,000 cubic yards near Cougar Dam from the, from the core. And the plan is that once we implement the entire project and have a little bit of monitoring time under our belt associated with that, that uh, monitoring project that I mentioned, that we would begin a, you know, one to two to three, you know, add, adding gravel on a one to two to three year basis. Uh, don't have a firm plan for that yet, but it's certainly a shortcoming in this particular project area. Great question. All right, uh, how many acres of new wetted floodplain did you create in phases one and two on the South Fork? Ooh, good question. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to pull those there. So the total, we, we, we've been calling the total project area um, about 200, and I, I think what we're saying is that um, combined at high flows, we've created about, I think it was 50, I'm trying to remember the numbers, 56 or 50, it was about a little bit over 50 for both projects. Um, so uh, probably a net gain wetted area, wetland type areas or flow, or actually flow surfaces of probably about 100 acres. Great. All right, here, here's a big one for you, Jared. Um, I understand there is some controversy about this project and I've heard some people grumble about it. What are the issues? So great question. And uh, we really wanna actually bring this, in. We, we were hoping to have more of these conversations throughout the community um, uh, this, this summer and this fall. And we haven't been able to do that, but this is one way that, that, that we can do it. A couple of the big um, concerns, um, are around initial disturbance. Um, so that, you know, we're, we're clearing wide swaths of riparian areas. We spent decades 
talking to the public about how important riparian areas are and the fact that they need to be retained and intact, you know, and, and left intact and protected. And then here we come in with excavators and clear 40 acres of riparian forest. And so um, I think what needs to be understand with that criticism is that these systems are built on, are, are, are dynamic, they're built and uh, around disturbance. We've taken that disturbance out of the landscape with, with flood control dams. And if you think back to that stream evolution model, the, this, this system, this river was in kind of that arrested development stage. And there wasn't any, mainly because of the dam, there wasn't any natural processes that was going to lead to that disturbance and it had to be manual. Um, and so what we hope to show through, through monitoring is the level of natural regeneration that happens, um, how limited, um, or maybe if the monitoring shows, more uh, active revegetation is needed. We did a little bit of, of revegetation for this project, but because it's so widespread and there's water everywhere, we really wanted to see what would happen with natural regeneration before a more um, uh, robust uh, planting effort. So that's number one, just that re the, the, the removal of the initial removal of the riparian vegetation. Um, and there's a couple more nuanced answers to that too that I don't think we'll have time to get to. But the other, the other part of the, the, the main concern, at least here, there's different uh, concerns in different landscapes like in Central Oregon. Uh, the other concern is sedimentation. Um, to some extent during implementation, but then long-term as well. We spent a lot of time talking about fines and, and, and sands and, and how that would actually impact if that would lead to increased uh, sedimentation or erosion of disturbed sur surfaces um, over time. Implementation-wise, yeah, we do have limited uh, impacts um, to downstream uh, turbidity impacts. Uh, try as we might, we can't get uh, complete um, uh, dewatering of the main stem river. And so we're going to have groundwater infiltration and things like that. And yet we do have short, some short-term turbidity impacts. We do a couple different steps to, to mitigate that through like um, uh, silt screens. Um, uh, uh, we can use pumps on occasion. Um, but what we have seen, at least on the South Fork, um, is long-term that we're not seeing high uh, cases of increased erosion. Um, and we're not seeing transport of those uh, uh, newly deposited fines and, and, uh, and sand in, in any large number that's having an impact on the, uh, the main stem McKenzie River. Once again, devil's going to be in the details and that long-term monitoring is really key to, to really answering those, those, that question in a kind of substantial way. This one kind of feeds into that a little bit. Um, in, in thinking about dams, sort of, what, what is the purpose of Cougar Dam, and is there a consideration to take the dam down? And then, I, you know, I think on a, on a larger context, like, you know, how do we do restoration within landscapes that are impacted by dams, right? This is something that you've worked really hard on. If you could speak a little bit to that. Yeah, so Cougar Dam is primarily a flood con control dam. It's part of the Willamette Project, the Coors Willamette Project, with a series of you know 13, 14, 15 dams, something like that. Primarily as a flood control dam, it has it does have some power generation capabilities, but they're relatively small. It's primarily a flood control um, for Eugene, Springfield, and downstream communities, right? Um, and so another reason that the South Fork was a priority because the Corps is under a biological opinion to address the impacts of those dams, primarily on uh, on um, well, on, on listed species, uh, for in this case, uh, bull trout and spring chinook salmon. And the South Fork on, on Cougar Dam, they've taken a number of steps. So you can think about dams having kind of four major impacts. They, have a ten, uh, they, they alter the, the flow regime. They take out the highs and the lows, right? Uh, they alter the temperature because you're pulling, because without those, those seasonal fluctuation and flows and you're pulling from the reservoir, you're, you're, you're uh, uh, reservoirs are going to have a huge temperature gradient, and so if you don't do something about that, you can be colder at certain times or warmer at certain times. They block fish passage or uh, aquatic organism passage, and then they block downstream passage of, of wood and sediment. So um, some of those things are really hard to address, but on Cougar, what they've done is that they they put in a temperature control tower um, back in the 90s or early 2000s um, that actually functions pretty well, can draw uh, water from any point in the, the reservoir and so they can match the, the natural uh, temperature curve. Um, 
they have uh, in, uh, put in a upstream passage facility that can pass adult fish. I haven't quite figured out downstream passage for juvenile fish uh, with these high head dams, really, really hard thing to do. Um, there are ways, this project helps address uh, the, 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 to an extent, the, the lack of downstream sediment of, of uh, transport of, of wood and sediment. Um, potentially as well then sets the stage for one thing that the Corps has worked on with the Nature Conservancy and others, really difficult to implement, but a, uh, a, a flow regime or a flow re release schedule that meant more, at least to an extent, mimics that natural flow fluctuation. And so you, you get some pulses of higher water. They actually did that for us in January of 2019, uh, released a flow of about 5,000, a little bit over 5,000 CFS into the South Fork so that we could get some more floodplain inundation and see how that system handled it. And we didn't see, you know, one of the other fears of this project and criticism of this approach is the amount of large wood that we're putting out on the project. And one, one fear was that, that, you know, that type of pulse would push that water out or push that wood out. We just didn't see that happen. You, you spread that water out, the velocities drop so 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 far. The stream power, uh, the, the the power of the stream has been dramatically reduced. That it, we were actually over underwhelmed when we went out there and looked at that flows at, at 5,000 CFS, just because not much was happening. It was it was kind of remarkable. So, hope that answers the question. Uh, so, Jared, do you want to talk about the fires? We have a question. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I decided not to throw any fire pictures up. I haven't been able to get access to the site, um, you know, but some of our Forest Service colleagues, I mentioned, or Kate, um, have been able to access the, the, the site and I actually got in a couple of spawning surveys uh, last week. So we're, we're, we're seeing Chinook uh, back onto the project right now. Uh, I think the last count they had was 109 reds um, as of earlier this week. Um, these, like I said, this was well within the fire perimeter. Some of the areas, like a Delta campground, I think burn really, really hot. Um, and so I think what my understanding is, is the surrounding forest is a combination of some of those very hot burns that are really significantly impacted to more of kind of that mosaic, lighter uh, intensity burn that actually can be really restorative and healthy um, for forests. Um, and then what we're seeing in the project itself, you know, we put wood obviously everywhere across, you know, through not only in, in the stream channels, but then across the entire floodplain itself is, is yes, some of that burned, but really kind of the, the early estimate that I'm getting secondhand from Kate is kind of like a more of five to 10% burn. So we're cautiously optimistic um, that this is an example of how these projects can be resilient. Um, so it's intuitive that they can be resilient to like a flood situation because you've really in increased that connectivity across a much wider spice. You've dropped that stream velocity. It'd be much easier for them to handle kind of a flow situation or a high flow situation. Anecdotal evidence so far that maybe they're also resilient to, uh, to large scale uh, 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 wildfires as well. And there's also some pretty good science out there that, uh, that shows floodplain reconnection projects actually might be a, a decent uh, way or, or an effective way um, to mitigate carbon or uh, store carbon and so mitigation against climate change. I haven't done any work on that on this project yet, but we, we, we hope to engage some uh, researchers uh, in, in that work um, within the coming years. Great, thank you. So for our, our last question, Jared, I really love this one. Um, we have a question from Paula, who lives in Marcola, and she wants to learn how to be a good steward of the Mohawk River. Um, I think the McKinsey Watershed Council is an organization that uh, this is what they do. And so, um, one, you know, do you do work in the Mohawk River is the question. And what's the scope? How do you assist landowners who want to be good stewards of the land? So, uh, I, I, my, my, my first job in, with, the, with, the, with the McKinsey Watershed Council was actually coordinating a small group of, of interest in landowners in, in, in the Mohawk, Mohawk Watershed Partnership. So I did that for about six, that was part of my job um, description for about almost 10 years. So really big fan of the Mohawk, um, a big fan of the people in the community um, and, and in a lot of ways, I really do think it's a hidden gem. Um, so I appreciate that connection. Um, we haven't done a lot of work, unfortunately, in the Mohawk and in about 10 years. A lot of that is kind of funded and priority driven by 
uh, the people that we're funded by, they, well, so much shifting has gone to more listed species that are not necessarily in the, in the Mohawk. Um, that doesn't mean we can or won't do work there. Um, early back in like the early 2000s and, and 1990s, the Mohawk was actually one of the, the landowners in the Mohawk were actually one of the leaders in, in implementing cooperative and voluntary uh, riparian restoration projects. Um, uh, and that is probably the, the, the easiest way to engage in being a watershed steward um, in the Mohawk. Uh, the Mohawk's a little challenging to work with in-stream projects like this because there's so much private land and uh, uh, doing a project of this magnitude where you're connecting wide swaths across an entire valley are just impractical um, you know, when, when you're talking about roads or bridges or homes or, or businesses in, in, in the way. Um, so I think the, con the one of the strategies that we're looking at, um, or been kind of your, that, that it's been a little bit more than late on the back burner for the Mohawk, but it's just combining riparian restoration projects um, on in the Mohawk in kind of the lowland areas and the lower reaches of, of the tributaries, and then coordinating with the with the BLM and um, also Warehouser, who's done a lot of really good um, culvert um, and road work. Um, in the Mohawk as well, those are kind of the two primary landowners. So I think a combination of, of coordinated projects um, in stream with the BLM and, and to an extent Warehouser on the uplands and then riparian projects um, with, with uh, private landowners in the lowlands. There's also a lot of ag um, as well, especially in the lower river. And there's uh, some of our partners like the NRCS and the Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, offer some really good incentive programs for things like livestock fencing and off-channel um, uh, livestock watering. Um, and, and we work in partnership with them to, to put those projects on the ground as well. So those would be the couple ways that I think about connecting um, on the Mohawk. Great, thank you so much, Jared. Um, I mentioned I'll be sending out an email tomorrow and I'll be sure to include a link to um, your website where people can go to learn more about activities with the uh, McKinsey Watershed Council. Um, I think there we will probably have to stop for the evening. Um, I really wanna thank you, Jared, for your willingness to share your expertise with us. Um, as you were speaking, I was thinking about this passage in one of my favorite natural history books, Eager by Ben Goldfarb. And he talked about how a wild river wants to dance across the landscape not race to the ocean. And um, I really appreciate the work that the McKinsey Watershed Council has done to set the stage that will allow for that river to dance. I'm really excited to see what happens in the future. I also really appreciate all of you joining us on this full moon evening. Um, please join us in two weeks for our next uh, Habit Chat. It'll be our third one and it's with Ashley Russell. Uh, she's the water protection specialist with the Confederated Tribes of the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusla Indians. And she'll be presenting a virtual ethnobotany tour of Ren Marsh, located on the Sayusla River. So again, Jared, thank you very much. Thank you all for joining. And I wish you all a nice evening and a restorative weekend. Take care. <laughs>